In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Certainly today is a difficult day to eat meat. It's hard if you attend today's Mass because we have a clear reference to the fact that in former times no meat was eaten at all during these 40 days. For the prayer of today's Mass, as we pray thee, O Lord, look mercifully upon thy people and grant that we, whom thou dost command to abstain from flesh meat, may likewise refrain from sin. This ancient rigor has been relaxed for probably a couple centuries, at least. Already by the beginning of the 20th century, there was no longer any reference to abstaining from meat for the entire 40 days. But in former times, this was the case, also from all dairy products. I have spoken to you already about how we might approach the question of fasting in our time. It would seem that in wealthy nations such as ours, where we have such a variety of foods available, going without meat for 40 days is really not so difficult. It's not as though we would all simply faint on the way. Nevertheless, our principles during this time should be simplicity and poverty in how we undergo a fast. We should not go out of our way to go to specialty food stores just to avoid eating meat. If meat is what we have in our stores to consume, it's better to keep things simple and eat what the good Lord has allowed us to have at our disposal. Nevertheless, we are also reminded in several of the prayers we have this week at Mass that the only reason to fast at all, or it is not an end in itself, the only reason to fast is so that we may permanently abstain from all sin. Today especially, we are warned against the sin of pride. Today's Gospel would seem, this always comes to my head when we read today's Gospel, is, seems to come as a response to the question, define bad timing. Our Lord has just told his 12 apostles that they are about to go up to Jerusalem and he will be handed over to sinners. He will be scourged. He will be beaten. He will be crucified and will die. And on the third day, he will rise again. And almost as a non sequitur, it seems the mother of James and John finds this to be the most opportune time to approach our Lord and ask for her two sons to have some special honors in their place with our Lord, asking him, grant that my sons may sit on your right hand and on your left. We might have hoped for some better response on the part of any of the apostles after what our Lord had just announced to them. And our Lord's response makes me think of what one holy priest would say centuries later, Fulton Sheen. He says, plenty of young men say that they're going to study to become a priest. It is rare to find a young man who says he's studying to become a victim. And yet that is what the priest is. Yes, of course, in our common manner of speaking, we say that we go to study for the priesthood, that we discern a vocation to the priesthood. We do not say we discern a vocation to victimhood. And yet that is precisely what it is to become a priest. To become a priest is to become a victim. And Fulton Sheen was not 
the first priest to speak in this manner. Other saints before him said that yes, our Lord Jesus Christ was priest, he was the sacrificial offering, he was the victim. And any priest who follows him, who participates in his priesthood, must be the same. He must become one with our Eucharistic Lord. And so he must be broken and devoured by men. This explains completely our Lord's response to the mother of the, son, of the sons of Zebedee. You know not what you ask. Can you drink? of the chalice of which I am to drink? The two sons, James and John, respond boldly, we can. And our Lord tells them that indeed you shall, but to sit on my right hand and my left, that is something already decreed by the Eternal Father. We are not surprised then that the other 10 are quite indignant that the two sons of Zebedee would have dared to say such things to our Lord, especially after what he had just announced about his passion. And of course, for us who have a devotion to St. John in particular, we are surprised that he should be involved in this. It would seem that our young St. John allowed his mother to be a bit impetuous and push him forward like a young seminarian in front of our Lord at this time. But our Lord goes on to say that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Worldly power then is something that belongs to the pagan world around us. Their great men, he says, exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever wishes to become great shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, even as the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This makes me think of one great pope of so long ago, who, after the close of the Age of Martyrs, and to become a pope meant to reign as pope, sometimes only for a few short weeks before being martyred, took as his official title, Servus Servorum Dei. This was Pope Gregory the Great. And ever since his time, that has always been the official title of the pope, servant of the servants of God. He who is first among us is only to be the lowest of all servants, serving all the servants of God. To be called to the holy priesthood, to be called to participate also in any way in the sacramental life of the church is to lay down your life as a ransom. This is true also of the sacrament of matrimony. These same words are used by the Apostle St. Paul, that husbands and wives are to lay down their lives for each other. They are to participate also in the sacrificial love of Christ. And all those who are baptized into Christ, the Apostle says, are baptized into his death. To become a Christian is not to inherit honor in any worldly sense. To reign as a Christian means simply to serve God, to lay down our lives for the brethren as a ransom, to participate in that one true ransom of Jesus Christ, which alone obtains for us salvation and eternal life. Amen.